I'm concluding a, a little short series on the focus has been on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And with the release of the uh, motion picture, The Son of God, and uh, the response has been overwhelming across the country to this movie. And if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go see the movie Son of God. And it'll be an encouragement to your faith. This week I did get a, um, a note in the mail, and, and the person didn't sign it, but I, I recognize their handwriting. <laughs> but I won't tell you who they are. Dear Pastor, because of my upbringing, I was a witness to many incidents of so-called spiritual works, not only by my own family elders, but also numerous professing Christians. Even as a child, I knew in my heart that somehow this wasn't what I wanted to become. Over my true walk before our Lord, I have learned that the one sure sign that he is present in an individual, that unmistakable evidence is compassion and true love. This assembly that you have been uh, chosen to shepherd as his representative abounds in this most comforting, reassuring, and loving gift. Isn't that good? Should I read that sentence again? <laughs> this assembly that you have been chosen to shepherd as his representative, abounds in this most comforting and reassuring and loving gift. I'm very glad I'm a member of this church family. I'm strengthened in this walk because of this fellowship and their leaders. And they are indeed faithful to Mark 12, 29 through 31, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. See you Sunday. Signed, number 6, 24 and 25. which says, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. So turn to the person next to you and say, may God bless you. You are amazing. Deanna and I are so grateful that we get to be a part of this church, that we get to be pastors here, and uh, we don't say it enough, but uh, Deanna and I really love you. We love being a part of this church, and we love you, and uh, grateful for that. Which reminded me that um, this last Friday, we don't usually do this, but this, uh, and uh, I say that because of all the people that go, you didn't recognize me, and uh, uh, just keep your eyes on Jesus, and, um, and that is this last Friday was Tony's birthday, and Tony is right here, and... Uh, And if I got it right, and of course, if you go to, my friend Scott Hubbard is not here, so I can say this. If you go to Knob Hill and shop, then you will probably cross paths with Tony, and I think he's the only employee in the whole store that gets his birthday celebrated each year. So if you went through the store on Friday, you saw balloons and all that, and it was Tony's. So when you see him later, you just say, uh, happy birthday. And he told me how old he is, and I said, you can't be that old. You look young. So at any rate, uh, he said, thank you. The 9th of March, there are 40 days until Easter. 40 days till Easter. In the traditions of the church, there's this season that we're in right now called Lent. It is the 40 days leading up to Easter. It's a time for preparing ourselves and examining ourselves and building and strengthening our faith in Jesus as we head forward. And this church is very much missions-minded. It means that we have a heart to share Jesus in every dimension of life with those who do not have all that we have and do not know Jesus. And we're invested in people all around the, the world that are sharing Christ in various countries. Every continent is represented through people that we support on a monthly basis. And uh, they're serving the cause of Christ there. And as it continues here, so our emphasis is being mission-minded. But missions is not the heart of this church. The heart of our church is worship. It is putting our lives before God and saying, you are in charge. You know, if you were to summarize the word worship, uh, the heart of worship, if you were to take one word and say, what is worship all about? Is it music? Is that worship? We said we have the worship, and now we're going to have the word. Um, worship is a form of music. Is it uh, 
worship because we gave in the offering? Is it worship because we prayed? What is worship? If you were to summarize the word worship in one word, that word would be surrender. That's the one word. And you will worship. If you don't realize it now, you're not aware of it, but you are worshiping. You are surrendered to someone or something in your life right now because that's the way we're wired. Does that make sense? That's the way God created us, and we're wired that way. For the last two weeks, I have shared this quote with you. It is very specific, so it's very focused, and he says it better than I can, so I want to read it again. And it says, C.S. Lewis wrote this many years ago. He says, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a crazy man on the level with the man who says he is a bean burrito or poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or else something worse. You know, you can shut Jesus up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. By the way, he is the greatest teacher ever, but he's more. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He intended to reveal his identity, that he is the living God. He is the creator of all heaven and earth. Through him, everything was created that has been created. He is the, we've just been singing about it, he is the redeemer. He is the restorer of our life. He is the one that in one, eventually he will redeem and restore all that is created and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. How many look forward to that one? I believe it. So this morning, I just want to present, we're going to share communion in just a minute. What will we do with Jesus? Now, you're, we're doing it or we're not doing it right now. But what will we do with Jesus? In 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul said this. He said, I resolved to know nothing, nothing I was, while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In the message, it says it this way. Friends, When I came to you, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. I like the way it says that. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, and then Jesus and what he has done. Jesus crucified. So, our focus is on the person of Jesus, and the most important thing that he did for us is by dying a cruel death on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we gather together today because Jesus did that for us. We've been singing about it. Now, I have a sense that we probably get a little numb because of everything that's going on around us to the idea of how great a sacrifice Jesus made for us. And how did we get to this point today? Why are we here? How did the world get here? In fact, mankind. And I just want to give you a quick understanding of what the good news is all about. Our problem and our challenge is we just don't know how good the good news really is. So here we go. Follow along in your notes. Lord willing, I will go fast because there's lots of points. But the Lord is willing that the pastor's not. So here we go. What is God's purpose? What is God's purpose for our lives? We were made to be... I'll stop right there. We were made to be. You were made. You weren't an accident, no matter who thinks you're an accident or who said you're an accident or who thinks you look like an accident. You were made to be. And the reason you're made to be is because God made you. He wanted you. He chose us. In fact, as weird as it may sound, he knew exactly the parents it would take to create the DNA to make me me. And to make you, you. And your parents may have thought they were totally messed up in an accident or whatever, but God worked through them to make you because he wanted you to be you. And you were made to be 
related to God. He wanted you and he wants you in his family. Now, you may be unwanted by a family. You may feel as though you've been rejected by a family, but there is the ultimate family, and it is the family of Jesus, and he wants us and you and me to be in his family. It is the most amazing thing. It is the most wonderful truth that you were made to be related to God. You may not feel related. You may feel like there are some people in this room probably have no living relatives. In fact, I love it when I hear people say, not because I'm wishing against their background, but I've heard through the years many people say, you know, the people I love Jesus with are closer to me than family. Well, I just got to tell you, there will be a time when physical identity families will be no more, but our spiritual family, the family of God, is eternal. It will last forever and ever and ever. So how many love everybody that's in the family of God? Yeah, there are some people we'll keep our distance from in heaven, but one day we will all spend eternity together. We were made to be related to God. It says in Ephesians, and I couldn't put all the verses on your notes, so if I say a verse that's not there, just write down the address and you can look it up later. But it says in Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 in the Living Bible, it says, long ago... Even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own. Wow. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. And in the uh, New Living Translation, said it was his pleasure to do so. Now listen, it doesn't get any better news than that. Everybody, God created us last, but he thought of us first. We were the last in creation. God made the heavens and the earth, and he put all the animals and the vegetation there. And last, he created men and women But he thought of us first. That's why he made things as he did. So the good news is we were made to be related to God. What's the bad news? The next step in this journey of life is we rejected the life and chose death. We rejected life and chose death. Now how did we do that? We did it by doing our own thing. If I were to summarize what worship is, I could summarize it in one word, and that word would be surrender. You will worship something or somebody. It is wired into you. You can't get away from it. But we, were, we rejected. Does that mean you did too? Did you reject life? Until you realize that you've really rejected life, you cannot embrace life. We rejected life and chose death. Our key verse for the year, and I think it is in the planner. Am I correct, Pastor Peter? So this is our verse, verses for the year. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life. Everybody say, choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God, obeying him and committing your, yourself fully to him. This is the key to your life. We were given a choice, and every one of us chose badly. How many here have done it your way? If I were a better singer, I could go, I did it my way. <laughs> How many are guilty of my way? How many found that to be good? Did that work out for you? John 12, Jesus said this way, I am the light that has come into the world so that all who believe in me won't have to stay any longer in the dark. I didn't come to reject the world. Jesus didn't come to reject you. He says, but all who reject me and my message will be judged 
by the truth that I have spoken. So the bad news is we reject the one who gives life, who is life, who is our life, and we embrace, we choose death. And so the problem is this. Number three. Thirdly, we realize we are off. And I put off in quotation marks. We are off. We have pain. We have problems. We have troubles, as Wendy read about. We have a challenge to overcome the problems that we have. We're sick and tired, and we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we can't get over the sick and tired. We're off. We have problems. Turn to the person next to you, and would you just tell them, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're off. I have no clue why that made some of you so happy. I do not understand that at all. God's purpose is that we would have a relationship with Him. The problem is that we rejected life. And we realize, remember the uh, story of Apollo 13? Houston, we have a problem. Well, you have a problem, and I have a problem. We are off. In Genesis 3, 7, you can jot that verse down. It's not in your notes. At the moment their eyes, Adam and Eve, were opened, at the moment their eyes were opened, they realized something was wrong. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And we have done the same for thousands of years because we recognize we're off. We try to cover ourselves and... uh, It may not be literally fig leaves, but in ways that we try to cover ourselves so people don't know the real me and the real you. We wear masks. We put on covers because we know something's not right. We must be off. We're off. And so we do different things. We put on masks because we're afraid of what people will think of us. Uh, We are lost lost. I was thinking about this. Isn't it amazing how many TV and movies have been built around the word lost? And uh, I think a while back there was a series that went on. I never saw it. I just got advertisements about it. It was, the series was called Lost. When I was a kid growing up, there was lost in space. The TV series I saw that was more about loss that had my attention was um, was um, (laughs) Pastor Peters helped me on the front row. He says Lost Ranger. I have no clue about Lost Ranger. I never saw that one. It must have been after my time. I don't know. I'm too old for that one. But it was entitled Gilligan's Island. The Gilligan, the skipper. Anyway, we understand lost. We recognize that lost is a big part of life. And when we're lost to God, then we are not in the place that we should be. It means that we're useless for the purposes God made us. As I said last week, it's like your keys are good things, but if they're lost, they're no good to you because they're not where they're supposed to be. How many here have trouble with your keys? You lose them. And uh, how many have a little uh, pager thing you put with your keys so that you can like beep it so you can find them? And, I, and I've seen my wife do this, not to pick on Deanna, but she has this big purse filled with it, just stuff. Oh. She asked me to carry it once in a while. And I can't pick it up. It's just, ah. But I've seen her at times go through that purse, and she can't find what she's looking for. It's lost. And she'll go, I think I, am I right? Is this right? She says, I am right. It's lost. And whatever's in that purse, even if it's lost, it doesn't do her any good. We are lost, and we're off. We're not doing it right. And so, fourthly, what happens in this journey of life is we react to life by experimenting. We react to life by experimenting. 
the old song, I have no idea who wrote it and who sang it. I can't remember, but there was an old song that says, I can't get no... How do you know that? And you young people are going, what are they talking about? But there's this really old guy that 50 years ago sang this song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. He's still alive today, and he still gets paid big bucks to sing the song. And it just goes, I can't get... Who is it, Tony? Yeah, Tony is telling me out front, Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger. So I, have no, I don't know who he is. Anyway... He's still singing the song. He still gets paid big bucks to tell us, I can't get no satisfaction. After all these years, he still can't get no satisfaction. (laughs) Now, the the same is true for us outside of being the person in Christ he wants us to be. Because ultimately, we keep going because it takes more of what we're trying to get to get the same buzz. I can't get no satisfaction. If you're trying things and experimenting with things, now the easy targets are drinking and drugs. Some of you have been there. You're just trying to experiment so I can get the buzz and be happy and trying to feel good about life. And it takes more and more of the same stuff to get the same buzz. It's diminishing returns. Some people are into religion because they are trying to get it right. Some people are into being a good person. Here it is. Here's the three things we try to do in order to experiment to get it right. We want to feel good. We want to be good, and we want to have the goods. And we think that'll satisfy us. We want the pleasure. We want possessions. We want the position. But we react to life by experimenting. If we can increase the pleasure, maybe it will ease the pain. People have pain in their lives. I can remember the, the lady, the family living next door to us, and the son was about my age, and we would hang out together some uh, when I was a teenager growing up, and his name was Mike, and his mom was a full-blown uh, uh, alcoholic. I mean, you, you would, during the day, you could not cross her without her being drunk, and she just couldn't find any resolution in life, so she covered it and masked it with her drinking and caused a lot of pain and some of you have experienced the pain of of alcoholism in those you love dearly those are closest to you that's just the surface issues it says in James 4 in the message you're spoiled children that's pretty straight isn't it you only want what will give you pleasure you're cheating on God if all you want is your own way you end up enemies of God and his way so we have a problem. How many believe that people have a problem? It's, it's at the core. How many believe the world has a problem? And the person, the answer, uh, famous song again years ago, Jesus is the answer for the world today. The answer is a person, and his name is Jesus. Being in his rightful place, given rightful rulership in our lives, The person is Jesus, and Jesus came to restore us to life through his death. He said, you should have death, but I will take your place, and I will give my life so that you can have your life back. Jesus came to restore us to life through his death. This is good news. How many would like to get what you deserve in life? People are thinking about that, scratching my head. This will be the question of the day. You know, if I only got what I deserved, how, how, how many uh, have an awareness that if you got what you deserved, you wouldn't be in such a good place? Jesus said, today is salvation day. Today is salvation day. For the Son of Man, why did the Son of Man come? The Son of Man, and who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. That's good news. Now, here's the big deal. Until you realize you're lost, you will not embrace the person who will save you. Until you realize you are lost, then you won't accept the one who gives life. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says this. It's verses 18 and 19. It says, God has done it all. 
He is restored. Everybody say restored. restored. He has restored our relationship with him. How? Through Christ. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start. How many here are glad that Jesus has given you a fresh start? You know, I've said it this way many times. Listen, we as people, how many know that there are people around you, they love to rub it in? I told you so. They, I told you so. How many have felt that about somebody and you wanted to say it, but you didn't say it, I told you so? You, know, you just thought it. I, I would like to tell them, I told you so. Jesus never comes to rub it in and to tell you, I, he comes to give you a fresh start. A fresh start. Giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. How many here have uh, done your fair share of sins? <laughs> How many here have done your fair share of sins? How many still have a problem sometimes with sinning? Wait a minute. Don't raise your hands. This is church. Don't do that. We got our acts together, right? Got our masks on. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. So the answer is a person, and he has a great passion for you. So the fifth thing in this journey of life is we are restored to relationship through Jesus Christ. If we put our trust in him and make him the center of our lives, he says, I'll restore you to rightful relationship with God and I will give you life and an abundant life. Abundant life. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18 in the message, how did Jesus restore this relationship? It says the message that points to Christ on the cross the message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those hell-bent on destruction. Isn't that a great way to say it? You will talk to people out there and they haven't realized that they're drowning yet. If people don't realize they're drowning, then they don't realize they need help. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. We are restored to relationship through Jesus Christ. Is it an automatic thing? If you just show up, then you're restored in your relationship with God through Jesus? No. 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 You get to choose life. The power is yours to choose life or to choose death. The passion, how much Jesus loved us, was that he would come why did God come to earth and become a human being and live this life and suffer like he suffered? By the way, uh, you know, I might have, if I was Jesus, I might have chose to come in the 21st century and have all the fine conveniences because I get up this morning. How many of you got to have a hot shower this morning when you got up? How many of you needed to take a shower this morning? You know, if I was Jesus, I might have showed up in the 21st century. Could I have? But he shows up 2,000 years ago when there's no hot running water. And uh, all, none, of the, none of the benefits we have in this day. Why did Jesus come? Because he wanted to demonstrate to us how much we mattered to him. Now, distance sometimes gets us dull. We don't appreciate who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Paul said, I determined to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. So what was the cross of Jesus? Just write this down. Just gives you some insight. There's scriptures. I wish I could go through all of them. But the cross of Jesus was, first of all, coming from glory. Coming from glory. Now, what was glory? Glory is being in all your, who you are and where you are being uh, the greatness and the goodness of God. Can you imagine how many think heaven will be pretty wonderful? When you die, you, you, uh, if you're walking with Jesus, you get to go to heaven. How many think that's a good thing? Yeah. 
How many think that will be better than earth? Yeah. Now, in this life, you will have troubles, but I have overcome the world, and I'm going to prepare a place, and one day I will come and get you, and you will join me in that place. Well, Jesus left, so, so to speak, he left that place which was all good and all loving and all right. It was where God has total rule and reign, where what God wants to happen happens, and he's great, he's a God of love. And he came to this earth, and not everything that God desires happens on this earth. Have you noticed? This is the one place in the creation, this is the one spot, this globe, where for a season God has given freedom to people to choose what they want to do. And you get to choose either life or death. And Jesus left a perfect relationship with a perfect place and came and joined us. That's coming from glory. He was rejected by people. Rejected by people. Now, 10 years ago when The Passion, the movie The Passion came, there was big stirring because some people thought that it was, gonna, it was blaming the Jewish people. But when you read the Bible, or the Jewish leaders, when you read the Bible, it says the, the religious leaders rejected Jesus. It says the government authorities rejected Jesus. It says the crowds rejected Jesus. And guess what? You and I have rejected Jesus. Jesus came on the planet and he was rejected. Even in his final hour, most of his closest followers ran from him. And by the way, we pick on Peter, you know. Uh, Jesus whispers to Peter, hey, listen, uh, I know you said you'd die for me, but before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Even Peter bailed out. Before you get too hard on Peter, though, I just want to point out that when Jesus was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was the one fighting for Jesus? It was Peter. And he whacked off Malchus's ear, and Jesus said, Peter, don't do that. We're not here for the sword. Well, don't you think that probably threw off Peter's thinking right there? He was ready to give his life there. But when Jesus said, stop, that's not what we're doing, then it, Peter's going, what's going on? What's going on? And then he rejected his Lord and Savior three times. Jesus came and dwelt among us and all of us, all mankind at one point or another have rejected Jesus. And then he openly was crucified in a public place outside the city. History records it. There was a man named Jesus and he was killed on a cross between two thieves. In the fourth century before Christ, the Persians invented or created a way for capital punishment. It is considered to be the most horrendous way to die in the history of the planet. And that was how Jesus was killed. Openly crucified. And he was showing, when he took up his cross, what was he doing? He was showing the extent of his love, the scope of his love. He was showing how great his love is. Romans 5 says this. I couldn't, I, I wrote out all the, but you couldn't get all the verses that I read on the notes today. So uh, you got to look them up later. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this. When we were utterly helpless, everybody say, Helpless. Have you come to the, ever come to the end of your rope and realized you were helpless? Yes. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God, he showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now, we weren't like kind of bad. We weren't like, yeah, a little sinner. We were bad at the core because we displaced Jesus from his rightful place and we put our own idol on the throne. How many want to be an American idol? No. Not a good choice. Now, for any of your friends that are trying out and they get there, I'll go, okay, that's great. Jesus died on the cross to show us how much he loves us. 
Now, I just want to tell you, we can't get a grasp on that. If you watch the movie Son of God and then watch the crucifixion, just think about it. Jesus, he was great enough to understand in that moment, and if he was... If it was only about you, he still would die on that cross. That's how much God loves you and God loves me. You may not feel like you matter to anybody else, but you matter to God. A pastor may not be able to pass your way and say, you really matter. But there is a God, and his name is Jesus, and he gives his spirit to confirm in you that you matter, and he loves you, and he loves you. And Lord, forgive us for those of us who take that casually. In just a moment, we're going to take some emblems that signify or, or a picture of what Jesus has done for us. He loved you so much that he died for you. That he died for you. And then last, satisfying God's pleasure. That was Jesus Christ. Satisfying God's pleasure. What is God's pleasure? Well, the Bible says God's pleasure is to reveal his glory. So what is glory? How many, how many use that word? Glory. Glory. How many have ever been around a uh, professional athlete? And, uh, how many ever, and uh, maybe you've gotten there. Uh, somebody gave me a baseball, a, a football card a while back. With, uh, it was a football card and had the guy's signature because he'd been with them. And uh, it was a football player from a couple decades back. I'm like, ooh, I'm close to the glory. <laughs> we know what that means, see? We love it when we can identify with somebody that's got a big name. or we're, When we get close to the big shot, we feel big too. That's what glory is all about. You see, God wanted to reveal his glory. His glory is who he is, his greatness, his goodness, his love, his life. It's about who he is. And uh, he wanted to reveal his glory and did so by showing how much he loved us. Isaiah 53, it says this. This was written 700 years before Jesus came on the planet. Listen to these words. It was the Lord's good plan. Good plan. It says the Lord's good plan. It meant... Good plan means to take the light in, to be well pleased, to have pleasure. It was the Lord's good plan to crush Jesus and fill him with suffering. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, whose sin is Jesus an offering for? His offering is for my sin and for your sin. He will have a multitude of children, many heirs. When he sees all that he is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. Did you know that, uh, how many here have children? How many take pleasure in your children? Most of the time. <laughs> there are times. When we accept Jesus, we become the family of God. We are God's children, and he takes pleasure in us. It says in Hebrews 2, Jesus now is crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death for us. Jesus, by God's grace, Jesus tested, tasted death, <laughs> tasted death for everyone in all the world. It was only right that God should make Jesus perfect through suffering in order to bring many children to share his glory. Now listen, we love a lot of things, enjoy a lot of things in this world, but we don't even have a clue what it means that God wants to share his glory with us. That means all that he is, it means all that he, who he is, it means all that he will create, all that we'll be a part of. How many think you'd like to uh, be close to Jesus? How many think you'd like to go to heaven when you die? How many think it'll be a wonderful thing? How many would like to go today? I want to go. I just don't want to go today. <laughs> Bring many children to share his glory. For Jesus is the one who leads them to salvation. Jesus is the one. He restored us to relationship because of his death. Sixth, we receive real life from Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. He saves me from my selfishness, from my sin, 
from my sensuality. Jesus gives me true life, and he is the life. I was put to death on the cross with Christ. Let's read this. Do you have this on your notes? Would you read this out loud with me? Let's read it together. Galatians 2.20. I was put to death on the cross with Christ, and I do not live anymore. It is Christ who lives in me. I still live in my body, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to save me. How many here identify with that verse? Number seven. We rejoice in our new life. Have we come full circle? We were made to be in relationship with God, and we walked away from the greatest thing we have, and it comes full circle through the person of Jesus because he wants to restore us to relationship with him, and we now can rejoice in our new life. Now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Everybody say friends of God. You may not be the friend of the president. You may not be friends with the mayor. You may not be friends with the star athlete, but you are a friend of God. You're, Mike, this is good news. It's the good news. Your past is forgiven. How many need your past to be forgiven? You need to have your past in the past. Or as the... Uh, Timon said, or one of those guys said, you need to put your past behind you. <laughs> you're present. You're not alone. You have a presence with you. His name is Jesus. You have a purpose to live, and you have his power in you to live it. And the promise, your future is bright. So what now? And so, my friends, because of God's great mercy, how are you all doing? Good answer. Mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. True worship. Circle the word offer at the beginning of the verse and the word offer at the end of the verse. What's our invitation? Offer. The heart of worship is surrender. When we see what a God he is and who he is and what he's done for us, it's the only reasonable thing to surrender our lives to him. In, Romans, in the Living Bible, Romans 12 one says, when you think of what God has done for you, is this too much to ask? Paul said, for me, living is for Christ and dying is even better. What did Jesus say about real living? If any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition. Shoulder your cross and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. How many have have experienced that? You've tried to keep your life and you, you were just losing all the time. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news... You will find true life. Anybody in this room found true life? I hope you have. What is the best way to live? The only way to live. The only way to truly live is to give our lives to Jesus. The one who gave life to us. The one who died for us. Now everybody listen. Pass this on to people that when you get to talk to people and share with them. You will surrender to someone or to something. You were designed so. You are free to choose, but you are not free to determine the outcome or the consequences. E. Stanley Jones said this, If you don't surrender to Christ, you will surrender to chaos. If you do not surrender to Christ you will surrender to chaos. So question, how many can look back and go, man, I can see in my past chaos because of the choices you made. So, how do we truly live? 
and we're landing the plane. As I said before, when he says, and in conclusion, what does that mean? Absolutely nothing. I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be crazy. On the level with a man who says he's a bean burrito, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he was a madman, or he was something worse. You can shut Jesus up for a fool. You can spit at him and you can kill him. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. But let us not come with any nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, you must put away your selfish ambition and shoulder your cross. So what's my cross? Confessing Jesus as Lord publicly. My cross is, first and foremost, I identify that he is the one I surrendered to. You, Jesus. Now, the place of public identification is through water baptism. But there's lots of ways you can identify with Jesus publicly. But we start with confessing that Jesus is Lord of my life publicly. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, he is the boss, he is the CEO, he is in charge of my life, he is the one who saved me, you will be saved. Confess Jesus is Lord. My cross, remember what Jesus did regularly. Remember what Jesus did regularly. Remember what Jesus did regularly. We're going to share communion, and that's one of the most important ways we can remember on a regular basis what Jesus has done for us. So I want to ask the servers if they would come and begin to serve, and that you would hold the juice and the bread, and we'll all be sharing together, we'll all serve, be served together, and we'll take together of uh, communion. Do you know that communion is called the Eucharist? And Eucharist means giving thanks. It is a moment when we remember all that Jesus did for us. And so I want you to take, this is an open communion for those that identify themselves as surrendered to Jesus. And just hold the juice and the bread. Pastor Peter's going to come and lead us in sharing this communion together. And let's, what is worship all about? What is the heart of worship? Surrender. Surrender. And that's what we do when we share together in this communion. For God so loved you and for God so loved me that Jesus came and he died a criminal's death on a cross that we could sit here this morning and look back and remember at what he did for us and celebrate and remember. Ryan's going to come and pray in just a minute before he does. I wanted to, I was reading through the scriptures, um, and, uh, Ephesians, what Pastor read when he started out in um, Ephesians 3, and this is in the voice. I read like four or five different translations, and this really jumped out at me this morning and wanted you to hear this. It says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, who grants us every spiritual blessing in these heavenly realms where we live in the Anointed, not because of anything we have done, but because of what He has done for us. God, even before He laid out the plans for the world, He wanted us to live holy lives characterized by love, free from sin, and blameless before him. Even before he thought of the world, he thought about you, and he thought about me. And he made a way for you, and he made a way for me. 
He destined us to be adopted as his children through the covenant, Jesus the Anointed One, inaugurated by his sacrificial life, Jesus' sacrificial life. This was his pleasure and his will for us. Ultimately, God is the only one worthy of praise for showing us his grace. He is merciful and marvelous, freely giving us these gifts in his beloved. Verse 7 says this, and I love this. Listen to this. It says, visualize this, his blood as Jesus, freely flowing down the cross, setting us free. Setting you and setting me free. We are forgiven for our sinful ways by the richness of his grace. For God so loved you, and for God so loved me, that he took your place, and he took my place, where we rightfully deserve to be. We were guilty. He was innocent. We deserve death. He deserved not death. But he took your place and he took my place on the cross that we would sit here today free, free from our sin. And so today, we're going to take the bread that symbolizes his body and we're going to take the cup that symbolizes that blood which ran down that cross and we're going to remember, and we're going to, we're going to be thankful. We're going to be thankful to our Savior who gave so much for us. Right. It's hard to believe that 2,000 years ago, Christ sat in a room, what they call the upper room, with his disciples, and they shared this. And I'll read a few passages out of Matthew about the communion, about sharing the, the bread and the wine together and what they signified. Matthew 26, 26 starts, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Today, this is one of our sacred ordinances of the church. This and baptism are the two that we do. And today we celebrate God's gift through his sacrifice to us. So I'm going to pray a blessing and then we'll take these together. Father, we ask that you bless this cup of juice and this bread, Father. And for what it symbolizes, Lord, your blood and your body, which was shed and broken for us. That we understand the depth of this sacrifice, Father God. That you gave everything because you love us, Father God. To forgive us of our sinful nature, Father. To give us that hope. So, Father, today as we, as we go through this action of taking communion, Lord, that you continue to inspire each and every one of us here. Lord, let it be nourishment to us, both spiritually and physically, Father. We thank you for your love in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's take the bread. And let's drink together. Us is to offer ourselves to God daily. In fact, the Bible is very specific. It says you're to offer your body to God daily. Your body. Now, why does the scripture say you should offer your body? Well, one, if you offer your body, everything else gets in there too. Secondly, it's through our body that we mostly go our own way and do our own thing. Because we put body first. And that's, body's a good thing. It's good to have a body. But it's not meant to be first. In fact, it says, Paul wrote to the church and he said, um, their problem is that they make their belly their God. That has to do with...
putting our bodies first. Isn't that a, I didn't say it, Paul did. So the first, the, the, the great aspect, confessing Jesus is Lord publicly, remembering who he is and what he's done for us regularly, and offering our bodies daily. I've heard it said many times through the years, we're a living sacrifice. So how many here have put your bodies, your life on the altar at times, and so to speak, figuratively speaking, your body crawled off the altar? Because <laughs> you're a living sacrifice. Hey, I gave it, then I crawled off. Offer your body to God daily. Who owns your body? God does. It says very specifically, through the shed blood of Jesus, he purchased your body. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And when I offer God my body, everything else comes along. And then set your sights on the real glory continually. The real glory is what we're experiencing in Christ today, but the real glory is going to be glorious. Beyond what you could ever ask or imagine, God has prepared for us. And then one more aspect of carrying our cross is to suffer with thanksgiving. We don't thank God for the suffering. We thank God in the midst of it. We don't say, thank you, Lord, that I got run over by that truck. Thank you, Lord, that you've kept me even though I put myself under the truck. Thank you, Lord, that you are still good. Confess Jesus as Lord daily, publicly. Remember what Jesus did regularly. Offer my body to God daily. Set your sights on glory continually and suffer with thanksgiving. Can I ask you a question? How are you all doing? Here's the answer. How you answer this question determines whether you get it or not. How are you all doing? Because of who God is and what he's done for us, we are all doing better than we deserve. So if we are taking up our cross to follow Jesus and somebody says, how are you all doing? How are you doing? I'm doing better than I deserve. If the, you know what the other answer is? If you answer the question, I deserve better, then you've got it upside down. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How y'all doing? Really? Even though uh, you may don't have enough money to pay the bills, are you still doing better than you deserve? Yeah. Maybe you don't have a new car, you got the old clunker, you're still better than you deserve? Yeah. Maybe you don't have a flat screen TV, you're still doing better than you deserve? Yeah. Maybe you don't have an iPhone, I don't, but you're still doing better than you deserve? Yeah. You're getting the idea. Here's the invitation, we'll sing one more time, as Deanna and the, and the musicians lead us with passion, here's, the, here's my invitation to you as we what is the heart of worship? Surrender. surrender. You will surrender to something or someone. If you don't surrender to Christ, ultimately we surrender to chaos. How many have been in chaos? Been there, done that. I mean, I think that's a good choice. The minute we begin to sing, as a point of dedication, what will we do with Jesus? And you'd say, I again recognize Jesus is God. He is the Lord. And I surrender as much as I understand and know how. I'm surrendering my life and my body to him. I'm giving you my life, Jesus. Then I want you to express that when we begin to sing by standing. Just standing and saying, and again, you, you tell God, I surrender. We used to sing that, I surrender all, I surrender all. I surrender. It's the best thing we can do when we surrender to Jesus. So let's sing together. Thanks for joining with us today in our streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.